This chemistry lesson covers a wide range of topics, including the scope of chemistry, particulate nature of matter, laws of chemical combinations, Dalton's atomic theory, SI units, mass particle relationship, mole concept, Avogadro's constant, and many more. Let's start by exploring the incredible world of atoms. Imagine a universe filled with tiny, invisible particles buzzing around. These particles are atoms, and they are the foundation of all matter. Just like a Lego set, atoms come in different shapes and sizes, and they combine to form everything around us. There are 118 known elements in the universe, and each element is made up of its unique type of atoms. Just like different Lego pieces in a set, each element has its own special characteristics. Carbon atoms have the amazing ability to form long chains and rings, making them the backbone of many essential molecules. In fact, our own bodies are composed of carbon-based compounds. Now, let's move on to molecules. Imagine molecules as teams of atoms coming together, like a squad working towards a common goal. These atoms join through chemical bonds, forming unique substances with their own properties. Take water, for example. It's a simple molecule, but also important for life. One molecule of water consists of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, bonded together like best friends. And guess what? Water makes up about 60% of our bodies. But molecules can be more complex too. Let's talk about glucose, a molecule that provides energy to our cells. It's like a superstar fuel for our bodies. Glucose is made up of 6 carbon atoms, 12 hydrogen atoms, and 6 oxygen atoms, all bonded together in a beautiful symphony of atoms. Now, let's move on to chemical arithmetic. It's just a way to understand the proportions of different elements in compounds. Let's take a famous compound, sodium chloride, or simply table salt. It's made up of sodium and chlorine atoms. The ratio of sodium to chlorine atoms is always the same, 1-1. Chemical arithmetic helps us predict the masses of substances involved in reactions. Let's imagine we have 10 grams of sodium and 35.5 grams of chlorine. When they combine, we find that the product is 45.5 grams of sodium chloride. Now, let's talk about chemical equations. It's like the language of chemistry, where we represent reactions using symbols and formulas. Here is a classic example, the reaction between hydrogen gas and oxygen gas to form water. We write it as 2H2 plus O2 gives 2H2O. It tells us that two molecules of hydrogen gas combine with one molecule of oxygen gas to produce two molecules of water. Now, let's put our knowledge to the test with a mind-boggling example. Imagine you have 10 grams of carbon and 80 grams of oxygen. When you burn them, what do you think you'll get? Yes, you guessed it right. It's carbon dioxide. And when we calculate the masses involved, we find that 10 grams of carbon combines with 32 grams of oxygen to produce 42 grams of carbon dioxide. Chemical arithmetic helps us understand and predict these fascinating transformations. Atoms are the fundamental units of elements, like hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. They are so small that we can't see them with our naked eyes. Scientists have discovered that each element has its own special kind of atom. For example, hydrogen atoms are different from carbon atoms. But how do we measure atoms? That's where the concept of mass comes in. Mass is a measure of how much matter an object contains. We use units like grams or kilograms to measure mass. And when it comes to measuring atoms, we use a special unit called the Atomic Mass Unit or AMU. Did you know that different atoms have different masses? For example, a carbon-12 atom has a mass of 12 atomic mass units. Enter the periodic table. 
This magical chart lists all the known elements and their atomic masses. Scientists have carefully measured and calculated the masses of different atoms. For instance, oxygen 16 has a relative atomic mass of 16 AMU. Now, let's zoom out a bit and talk about molecules. Molecules are formed when atoms join together. Take water, for example. It's made up of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. When they bond together, they form a water molecule. And guess what? Molecules also have their own masses. The mass of a molecule is the sum of the masses of all the atoms it contains. To measure the mass of a molecule, we use a unit called the molar mass. It's like a VIP pass that tells us how much a mole of a substance weighs. Now, you might be wondering, what's a mole? A mole is a number unit. Just like we use a dozen to represent 12 items, we use a mole to represent a mind-bogglingly large number of particles. A mole is a whopping 6.0 to 2 multiplied by 10 raised to 23 particles. It's like having a suitcase filled with trillions of atoms or molecules. That's why we call it Avogadro's constant, named after the brilliant scientist Amedeo Avogadro. If we know the mass of a substance and its molar mass, we can calculate the number of moles using a simple equation, moles equals mass divided by molar mass. And the beauty of this equation is that we can go in the reverse direction too. If we know the number of moles, we can calculate the mass using another handy formula, mass equals moles times molar mass. Imagine we have 36 grams of water. How many moles of water do we have? We can use our formula, moles equals mass divided by molar mass. The molar mass of water is 18 grams per mole. So, 36 grams divided by 18 grams per mole gives us 2 moles of water. We can also calculate the mass when we know the number of moles. Let's say we have 3 moles of carbon dioxide, CO2. The molar mass of carbon dioxide is 44 grams per mole. So, 3 moles times 44 grams per mole gives us a mass of 132 grams. Atoms join forces to create molecules. It's like a chemistry party where atoms come together and dance to create amazing compounds. We can represent molecules using molecular formulas. The molecular formula for water. It tells us that a water molecule consists of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. But what if we want to know the simplest ratio of atoms in a compound? That's where empirical formulas come in. Empirical formulas give us the relative atom counts of different elements in a compound. Take glucose, for example. Its molecular formula is C6H12O6, but its empirical formula is CH2O. The empirical formula gives us the simplest ratio of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms in glucose. Now, let's put our thinking caps on and solve a little puzzle. Imagine we have a mystery compound with 58.8% carbon, 28.4% oxygen, 8.28% nitrogen, and 6.56% hydrogen. Can you guess what the empirical formula of this compound could be? To solve this puzzle, we need to calculate the percentage composition of each element in the compound. Remember, percentage composition helps us determine the amount of each element in the formula. Once we have the percentage composition, we can find the empirical formula by determining the simplest ratio of atoms. It's like finding the key to unlock the secret formula. Now let's move on to another exciting concept, chemical equations and reaction stoichiometry. Chemical equations are like magical recipes that show how different substances interact and transform into new ones. They give us both qualitative and quantitative information about a reaction. Qualitatively, chemical equations tell us which substances react and what they produce. For example, when iron reacts with oxygen, it forms iron oxide. 
But quantitative information is where things get really interesting. Balanced chemical equations give us the precise ratio of reactants and products. This means we can calculate the number of atoms, molecules, or formula units involved in a reaction. We can even determine their masses and volumes. And here is a fact, the ratios in a balanced chemical equation apply not only to the number of particles, but also to their masses and volumes. It's like a mathematical dance between the elements. Let's take an example, the reaction of iron with oxygen to form iron oxide. The balanced equation tells us that 4 moles of iron react with 3 moles of oxygen to produce 2 moles of iron oxide. By using the molar masses of iron and oxygen, we can also calculate the masses involved in the reaction. And remember, gases have their own special relationship with volume. One mole of any gas occupies 22.7 liters at standard temperature and pressure. That brings this lesson to an end. For additional information on this lesson, please look at the content below the video in the online course. To get a list of the important questions and their answers for this lesson, please refer to the guidebook via publications provided to you with this course for free. It shows you a list of all the questions that have the highest chance of coming in your next exams based on research carried out on previous year question papers. All the best, and I'll see you in the next lesson.